afternoon, everybody. My name is Joe Manning from the Departments of History and Classics. What's an historian like me doing in a place like this? I think we're going to find out over the next hour um, why I'm so attracted to this, this sort of work. This, uh, and thanks for coming out today. This is year two of what I call the Yale Nile Initiative, which is an excuse to talk about history and paleoclimate altogether around n not just the Nile River uh, Basin, but um, more broadly um, as well. Um, and I am really thrilled to be able to welcome uh, Joe McConnell from the Desert Research Institute um, here today to kind of kick us off um, this year. Joe is uh, a research professor in the hydrology division of the Desert Research um, Institute, very well known to um, everyone in uh, ice core science kind of broadly, um, a, pi a real pioneer in continuous flow analysis. His lab is really famous for having two ICPMSs, which when I see these things as an historian, they're kind of magic boxes. These things, these are amazing um, machines. And I think the only lab in the world that allows um, real data to be um, visualized, uh, or data to be visualized in real time, which is spectacular. I'm taking some of my students out there in about three weeks, and we're really excited to go out there and have fun with ice core um, analysis. He, uh, Joe, uh, besides just basic ice core science, of course, uh, the last few years he's gotten hooked on doing history and archaeology, and we're really grateful in the ancient history community um, for all kinds of reasons. It's uh, Michael Siegel, a postdoc in Joe's lab, um, and Joe is an author as well, in Nature from three years ago um, on a new chronology of the uh, volcanic eruptions in Antarctic and Greenland ice that revolutionized pre-industrial history, I think. It's one of the most important papers in ancient history um, in decades, I think. I make all my students read it because it's fundamentally um, important. Um, and when did this come out, Joe? A few months ago, um, in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, this fundamentally interesting paper, lead pollution recorded in Greenland ice indicates European emissions tracked plagues, wars, and imperial expansion during antiquity. This is a phenomenally interesting um, paper. It's lit up the world of Iron Age archaeology, and in particular, Roman um, historians. And it really is sort of a first sort of paper that's going to generate, I think, years of, of research in, in Roman history and the first millennium BC worlds, let alone work in ice core analysis. So with that as a brief introduction, I will turn the floor over to Dr. Joe McConnell. Okay, can you hear me okay? Yeah? Um, thank you all for coming, and thanks to Joe Manning for the invitation. Um, I was telling Brian Skinner a minute ago that uh, I first set foot in, on Yale campus and in this lecture hall 40 years ago this month. Hard to believe, and it was to hear Brian give uh, his uh, introductory geology class. So, anyway. <laughs> Who, who would have thought I'd be here talking about history? But anyway. <laughs> um, OK, so I'm going to talk about ancient, the title is Ancient History and Ice. I have uh, uh, two primary collaborators on the work that I'm going to talk about. Andrew Wilson, some of you historians may know him at Oxford. And Andreas Stoll is a, a very well-known um, atmospheric modeler in Norway at the Norwegian Institute of Polar Research, uh, sorry, Air Research. And then, uh, we had other co-authors, a uh, couple people, Monica and Nathan from my group, Sabina Eckhart from uh, NILU as well, uh, a couple more people from Oxford, Elizabeth and Mark Pollard, and then J.P. Stephenson from the University of Copenhagen. Uh, definitely a very much a collaborative effort. Uh, funding, always have to acknowledge the funding. Uh, so most of the work that I do is funded by NSF, some by NASA, uh, but most of it by NSF, uh, Arctic and Antarctic programs. Uh, I've made about um, 25 trips to, the Green to Greenland over the last 25 years and about uh, more than 10 trips to Antarctic uh, for the, funded by these programs. So the specific work, most of the specific work I'm going to be talking about today was funded by um, the John Feld Fund at Oxford and uh, the Desert Research Institute, my institute. So some of you may know, uh, some of the historians may know that um, in the 90s, uh, People measured uh, lead in ice, in Greenland ice, uh, Rossman et al. in 97 and Hong et al. in 94. And they published this record. Uh, this was the Rossman record. Uh, so this is concentration. These are isotopes on this axis. 
And you can see that during you know, 1000 BC to 1600 AD, it looks like, and you can see there was this increase during the, the Greek and Roman period and a drop in the isotopes. And this um, created a lot of buzz in the his ancient historian world about uh, what information you could get from ice. And as a result of that, well, this is just another graph of the same data, the same concentration points. And uh, so these guys measured 18 measurements over this uh, 18, 1900 year period. And each measurement represented what they thought was two years of ice. So that was the record that historians were using for these, these studies of the Roman economy and the Greek economy and so forth. And after that, so the, the Andrew Wilson and Mark Pollard from Oxford came to me because they knew I could measure lead very accurately in ice. And this is the record that we developed. And this is what I'm going to be talking sort of around and, and about uh, today. And you can see you get a very different picture of, of lead pollution in Greenland from this much, much higher resolution record. And so our measurements have, instead of having 18, we have 21,000 measurements across the same time period. And we have about 12 measurements per year during antiquity. Okay? So it's a, a very different record that in, gives you a much different uh, picture. But you can see that the, ab the ab concentrations are pretty much in agreement. They're very much in agreement with the previous work. So an outline of what I'm going to talk about, um, because this is kind of a mixed audience of, of earth scientists and historians, I thought I'd kind of try to thread, thread the needle between the two. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the archive of past environmental change in glacier ice, just to kind of bring you up to speed with that. And then I'm going to talk about continuous lead record during antiquity, the specific paper that Joe referred to, and then some conclusions and future plans. So imagine you're standing on an ice sheet. There's snow falling around you. Uh, it's going to pile up around your feet, and it's going to be very low density, fluffy stuff. It, as, it, as time goes by, it's going to start to age and be buried. And that's going to form a surface layer that's harder and more compact. Eventually, this thing is going to squeeze down, trapping air bubbles and then, and then the ice. And eventually, at about 60 to uh, 110 meters, depending on the site, you're going to turn from uh, fern or old snow into ice. So you're going to close the pores off, uh, the, the air bubbles off. And then you're going to trap, at that point, uh, some picture of the atmosphere at that time, right? Um, and these are the, the seminal records that you hear about in climate change science of carbon dioxide and, and carbon monoxide and methane. So really fundamental cornerstones of climate change science. Well, different than that are, is the, what's in the precipitation itself. So that's the water isotopes. And water isotopes we use as a, a proxy of temperature, of site temperature. Very well known, again, very much a cornerstone of climate change science, comparing especially water isotopes to the gas records. right? Um, in addition to that, you get sea spray, you get aerosols, so-called aerosols. And by aerosols, I mean uh, very small droplets or particles that are in the air all around us. Uh, they come from, in the natural world, things like sea spray and dust. And then in the more recent period, maybe the last 3,000 years, uh, you get pollutants. And so I was just going to show you this quick little, a little part of the simulation. This is a simulation from NASA. And it's a, a simulation of aerosols moving around the Earth. Some of you may have seen it. Uh, in this, you can see down here, sea salts are co co uh, coated blue. Uh, desert dust is red. Organic and black carbon is green. And then the sulfates in uh, white. And just as you're watching it, you, know, you can see things coming off of biomass burning plumes in Africa and South America. Uh, you can see dust coming off the Sahel and the Sahara. And you can see pollutants and so forth. And I won't run it for very long, I don't think. Let's see if this is going to work. So I personally find this very mesmerizing. It's kind of like watching a fire. You know, you can see everything kind of swirling around. Uh, so you can see, the, the, as an example, you can see the big sea salt storms circling, encircling Antarctica, right, sweeping around there. You can see sulfates coming off of the industrial parts of North America, Western Europe, and, uh, and Asia. Uh, you can see here's the, the dust, the big sw dust swirls coming off of uh, the Sahel and sweeping out over the Atlantic and fertilizing it. And then watch here, you can see these, these big biomass burning plumes coming off of these regions. Uh, now, some of that aerosol, you know, not, not much of it, but quite a small percentage of it actually, uh, ends up getting swept up over the Greenland and Antarctic continents and gets deposited with the precipitation or gets dry deposited onto the snow and gets buried. And that's what we measure with the ice core, right? 
So, uh, and then every once in a while, just to make sure everybody's on the same page, every once in a while you get a nuclear explosion, which we know very well about in Nevada. You get a nuclear explosion or you get a cosmic ray burst in the upper atmosphere or you get a volcanic eruption that creates a, a sulfur, uh, increase in sulfur in the atmosphere. And those get deposited all around the Earth pretty much at the same time, and that gives you an isochrone that we can then use for cross-dating ice cores. We can use it for confirming our dating, and we can use it for synchronizing to other archives, things like uh, um, uh, lake sediments or ocean sediments and things like that. Um, so yeah, so then we go and drill an ice core, and you can see we're just gonna drill an ice core from the top to the bottom. The, the ice at the top is the age of when we drilled the ice core here. Uh, so whatever date we started drilling, and it's just gonna go down however far, uh, I think the longest ice core is about 3.4 kilometers long. So this is just gonna penetrate ice down 3.4 kilometers for a couple of miles. This is just a quick schematic of uh, what a glacier or an ice sheet looks like, in this case an ice sheet. So you can divide it into sort of two zones, the accumulation zone. So that's where you're in positive surface mass balance. So more snow is falling out of the sky than is melting. And so you gotta, that's where you're building up layers year after year after year. You have the ablation zone where that, the opposite is, is, is the case. You have negative mass balance. In order to keep this thing at steady state, you have to transport through flow, ice flow, you have to transport mass from the accumulation zone into the ablation zone. So you can imagine normally we would go to the uh, accumulation zones to drill ice cores because we want layers piling up year after year. We don't want, uh, we don't want to be missing years or we don't want to have negative mass balance. Uh, I should add that these days uh, there is quite a bit of work going on in the ablation zones. Uh, and that's because you don't have to drill through hundreds or thousands of meters of snow to get to the old stuff. The old stuff is exposed right at the surface. So if you want big samples, uh, we typically nowadays you go to the ablation zones. You can imagine it's very difficult to date this ice. This is very, there's a lot of flow uh, distortion and then there's also the dating issue. But there is quite a bit of work going on in that area. So, so I just thought I'd say a little bit about sampling the archive. So that you can imagine I divided up into three, three different methods of our sort of scales. Uh, the deep uh, sampling is, uh, this is a millennial scale or well, multi-millennial scale uh, work. Uh, this is an example at Seifel Dome. So these are big projects, they might take four to five, six years. They usually involve multiple institutions and often involve multiple countries. So big operations cost tens of millions of dollars. Uh, this is another example from the Danish group. Uh, the Danes do a lot of drilling in, in Greenland because of their historical connection to Greenland. Uh, this is the camp in 2011 at Neem. And so this is the geodesic dome they had built. And it's pretty neat. You live in this thing. This is the galley. You don't work in this part. You just live here and recreate there and so forth. Um, and they've now put this thing on skis. And so they can drag it around the ice sheet. So this has been dragged to the other side of the ice sheet and is now being used in the egrip project. Uh, anyway, so really neat building. And I'm amazed that they're able to drag it across the ice sheet. But you can see a C-130, a U.S. Uh, LC-130 there, a ski plane, and that's for the heavy lift uh, capacity to provide the logistics for the camp. Now, most of the work, as I said, we just recreate in this building. Uh, most of the work actually happens in trenches, and these are, um, you know, maybe 30 feet or 10 meters deep that are using a snowblower to make them, and then you cover them over, and you can see the advantages or the disadvantages that it's cold and you feel like a troglodyte in there. Uh, the advantage, though, is that the weather can be doing anything uh, upstairs and you have no idea what it is, so you can work in any environments. Uh, this is the deep drill, so this drill will eventually go down 2.8 kilometers. So. Um, and, then fine, and then the intermediate sampling would be uh, what maybe 100 to 200 meter long cores. And by the way, the total depth is 200 meters. We handle it in typically one meter sections. So uh, anyway, the, uh, and I do, my group has done a lot of this kind of work. Uh, including the Arctic Circle Traverse, where we went by snowmobile across Greenland, collecting ice cores and doing radar surveys. Um, might take you, let's say, a few days to a, a week or two to drill a, a, two, a 100 to 200 meter core. And then I've also done some work. This is with the Australians uh, at Aurora Basin in East Antarctica. And you can see this is the camp. They're the, the buildings where we work. And these are all the sleeping tents. Everybody has their own sleeping tent to have some privacy, get away from people a little bit, um, supplied by, uh, not by C-130, but supplied by Bassler aircraft. It's a, DC, a stretch DC-3. Uh, and then this is the, the drilling operation. So this very small little drilling tent, again, embedded a little bit into the snow. This is the old surface right here. 
and a tent so you can work in any environment. And you can see this is Christmas dinner. It's not too bad. Uh, life is pretty good. We got wine. We got pretty good sheep. And then if you're really good, Santa Claus will show up and you can, <laughs> you, you've got to be good. Uh, anyway, and then there's uh, sampling, uh, shallow sampling. And my group, is, this was originally what we sort of specialized in. And these would be maybe 30 meter cores. So maybe you're looking at a decades to maybe one century long record. Uh, and you can, this is a technique that I developed called commuter coring. And the reason was that when we first started doing this, we would get taken out by a ski plane, the Twin Otter like this on skis. We'd get dropped off with all of our camping gear. Plane would go away, and a couple days later, if we're lucky, they'd come back and get us. Uh, but at one point in time, we were, at the beginning of the project, we'd gone our, we were on our fourth of eight sites, and we got stuck for a week at a site, and our generator was giving out, and our stoves were giving out. It was touch and go. <laughs> anyway, so I came up with this idea of keeping that $20 million plane and the pilots with us. So they don't get to leave, and they're not going to leave us out there in that situation. So the key is to be home in time for dinner, and then anyway, if, you're, if you're stuck in, or whatever, you know, by the weather or by uh, broken planes or whatever, you're stuck on the coast. So uh, it's much safer, and it's actually cheaper because you're flying out uh, full of, of, ice, of empty ice core boxes and camping gear and so forth. You get dropped off, you do your work, I mean, you don't get dropped off, you do your work and you fly back uh, light on fuel and heavy on ice cores. So it's, uh, it only takes one round trip instead of two round trips. So it's, NASA loved us because of this. Now you can imagine you're a pilot or a, a co-pilot, and you're sitting up there, and you're, it's about minus 25, minus 30, and you think, well, what am I going to do? You can sit in the plane and watch us and get really cold, or you can help us. And so there's the, the co-pilot, the pilot. <laughs> It makes a big difference, uh, especially when you get a really big, strong Danish pilot who can lift, or co-pilot who can lift anything. So, um, ice core analysis. I just thought I'd say a little bit about ice core analysis. Uh, so, in the old days, as in this record we were talking about earlier from Rossman, these were their 18 points that they measured over this 1900-year period, right? 18 measurements, two years each. Now, why would they measure so little? Make so few measurements. Fundamental question, right? Well, the reason was because they were doing discrete sample analysis. And for metals, very, very low levels of metals, they were loading up a piece of ice right here into a, into a lathe that's a hand lathe. And they were scraping very carefully by hand. They were chiseling off ice and catching it in this little bucket. So they're all dressed up in their clean gear and all that sort of thing, working under a laminar bench and so forth. And they're slowly scraping this off and you know, progressively working their way towards the, the uncontaminated inner part of the ice. You can imagine, hugely time intensive. I, I've been told that it took uh, Song Ming Hong and colleagues uh, up to six months to make, to, to chisel those 18 samples. It's a big deal, right? We have gotten around that now, uh, and that's why we have this, so many more samples like this, by using continuous analysis, and Joe alluded to it a minute ago. Uh, so continuous analysis rather than discrete. And in this case, we're going to use, uh, well, so let's back up a little bit. So here's the cylindrical core. So you can imagine a cylindrical core about 10 centimeters in diameter, a meter long. We're going to cut from that uh, um, approximately 3.3 .3 by 3.3 centimeter by a hundred, or one meter long, 100 centimeter long stick of ice. So it's like this long stick. And uh, we can cut, uh, in one project, we actually cut seven of those sticks from one 10 centimeter core. So we can analyze the core over and over again. We don't use anywhere near all the ice on one analysis. Then we're going to clean the ends very carefully, as you can see here. For those of you who know who Michael Siegel is, he's the hand model here. Uh, we're going to use, uh, this is a ceramic potato peeler you can buy from Amazon or whatever. Uh, but, but it's really important that we get the ends really clean, and so ceramic is really the only way to go. It, that we can get it clean enough for these metals. And then we're going to load that stick. So there's that stick I was talking about. We're going to load it up into this melter stand here that we developed. And the ice is just going to fall by gravity down onto this heated melter plate. That I'll show you in a second. So here's the melter plate down here. It's just going to fall by gravity. The, the melter plate is very, uh, the temperature is controlled very carefully. And that water is going to melt, and we're going to suck it off and analyze it in real time in about a million dollars worth of analytical equipment. Uh, let's see. Whoop. What am I doing here? So 
this is what the melter head looks like. And so you can see about uh, the 3.3 the by 3.3 centimeter stick of ice sits on top of it. These ridges that are engraved into the melter head separate the melt water into different sections. The innermost 10% is what we analyze using those high resolution ICPMSs that Joe mentioned uh, for elemental measurements. Uh, the next 20% or so we're going to pump off into different, a whole bank of, of instruments that we measure things like nitrate and sulfate, uh, sorry, nitrate and ammonium and things that are and water isotopes, things that are very difficult to contaminate and occur at much higher levels. And then the final 70%, the outer 70% we're going to throw away as potentially contaminated. So instead of chiseling day after day, month after month, we're going to use the melter system to clean the ice, to decontaminate the ice. So we're only going to use that innermost 10%. Well, the difference is we don't have to chisel. It just, it just happens in real time. It's fantastic. Um, yeah, so let me show you. Let's see, where are we next? No, so this is a schematic, and I won't bore you with the details here, but this is a schematic. There's the melter stand in the cold room. It falls down onto the melter head. We take that 10% inner part and send it off to this, it's this kind of setup. So the two ICPMS is right here. We collect fractions for later on analysis if we want as an archive. And then the other part we send over this direction. Uh, in this particular case, um, I'm showing that this is our gas method. We don't do the gas measurements ourselves. So we used to think of those gases that were bubbling out of the water, we used to think of that as a waste product and be annoyed by it uh, because we don't want those air bubbles to go through our system. But uh, starting about three or four years ago, four or five years ago now, the Danes and the French uh, and the people at Oregon State were developing methods to measure that gas in, in continuous mode as well. And it's all a function of technology. It's cavity ring down uh, measurement systems that make it possible. But so now we can get uh, methane and CO measurements continuously as part of this whole thing. So out of that little stick of ice, we can get about 35 different measurements of uh, elements and chemical species. And then as well as the gases and the water isotopes, all out of that little 3 by 3, 3.3 by 3.3 stick of ice. So it's really revolutionized this, our industry in that we can get so much information out of so little ice, and that saves the other ice for other applications. For those who are interested, this is uh, sort of what we're doing with the periodic table nowadays. So the ones that are in solid circles, we routinely measure. So we're covering a pretty good part of the, of the, of the periodic table. Uh, the ones that are dashed, like plutonium down here, uh, we only measure that under special circumstances. Uh, just as a little aside to plutonium, we published a paper last year, maybe the year before, on continuous measurements of plutonium. And so what we're doing that for is to try to see the bomb pulses, the 53 to six, no, 54 to 63 period of thermonuclear testing. And we need that. We'd like to know that for the thermonuclear perspective, but also for dating ice cores. And we came up with a continuous method for that, but the, the height of the peak of the bomb pulse period is one part per quadrillion. So that's one gram in 10 to the 15th grams of plutonium. It's ex yeah, to, make, to make that measurement is extremely sensitive uh, analytical equipment. So. so let me just show you this little video uh, of the lab, just to give you a picture worth a thousand words kind of thing. The first couple of seconds is uh, green for some unknown reason. <laughs> It'll change here. So this is Nathan, my, one of my PhD students, uh, working on the core. And so he's just uh, shaving it down to make sure it'll fit in the melter stand. So that's you know, one meter long, about 3.3 3 by 3.3 .3 in cross section. You can imagine in the ice, we can't tell what's up or down So once it's in, until we analyze it. And so we want to keep up, up. So up is always to the right. And he's put that X in there to mark the top of the core so we can keep track of it. It goes through the melter. And now he's cleaning the ends very carefully because the ends are going to go into the melter system. They're not going to get thrown away as part of that 70%. So since that's going into the analytical system, we need it to be really, really clean, very, very clean. So he's done that. Now he's, we've loaded it up into the melter stand. You can see the ice poking out the top there. It's falling by gravity down onto the melter head and slowly melting. I should add that the melter head is made out of a ceramic, a silica carbide. So you can clean it with conch acid and all that sort of thing, and we do routinely. Uh, this is it sped up, obviously, but there's the ice falling through the melter head. And there's time right there. And uh, you can see Nathan's whipping in there. He's very fast. And uh, the, uh, you can just see the ice. And so you can imagine we, get, we can generate data incredibly quickly compared to the old days. Uh, in fact, my group is sort of swimming in data. We can't, uh, we, we, the group is not big enough to publish all these data in a timely way. So if you need data, talk to me. So um, anyway, so then you can see the, the water's being pumped and the air bubbles and so forth are being pumped. 
into different uh, analytical systems. When my students first or postdocs first see this, they freak out because of all that spaghetti. But after you get used to it, it's pretty clear how it works. So you can see all that gas water mixture is getting pumped through the whole system. Uh, and then uh, we go through bubble detectors to, do, to determine the air water mixture we're seeing and that sort of thing. And those of you in Joe's seminar will see all this and get to scrape ice yourselves here soon. Uh, and then in this case, we're doing gases. So you can see the, the bubbles going into that 1D bubbler, and, and that's sealed, so the gas is going out the top. So I think that's it. OK, so um, I hope I've covered that first part, uh, what the archive is, how it's formed, uh, some of the issues, you know, accumulation versus ablation zone, that kind of thing, uh, how we sample that with different, uh, different scales and then our discrete versus continuous analysis. So now I thought I'd talk a little, about, a little bit about this lead during antiquity story. And it's, um, there's some extremely important steps in all this, so I'm not just gonna go straight to the record. So this is the paper that Joe alluded to or, or mentioned. Um, and it was, as I said earlier, it was a collaboration with uh, historians at Oxford, archeologists at Oxford, our group, uh, the Norwegian Institute for Air Research, and the University of Copenhagen, and their main contribution is they provided us with the ice. So a very important contribution. <laughs> um, so first of all, so the question we're going to ask is, why does Greenland lead, uh, what does Greenland lead pollution tell us about ancient economies during antiquity? First question, who cares? Right? Well, I hope this audience cares. I hope I don't have to convince you. Uh, but certainly, ancient his, uh, and economic historians and political scientists and archaeologists would like to know some quantitative information about ancient economies. Uh, and what, what controlled them or what drove increases and decreases in economic activity. <clears throat> so, oops, sorry, as environmental scientists, of course, we'd also like to know, uh, you know, we'd like to know, assess human impacts and the idea that humans were having a measurable impact on the environment 2,000 or 3,000 years ago is not something that you kind of take lightly. <clears throat> Why lead? Well, lead, it turns out, was that most of the silver that existed in, uh, most of the silver that was mined by the Romans, and they, and they wanted silver for their coinage, because they were silver-based coinage. Uh, most of that silver occurred as lead, as galena ores, so lead-silver uh, combination. And, and pretty much sort of rule of thumb, for every gram of silver they produced, they produced uh, 99 grams of lead. And lead with this lower boiling point was easily, uh, a lot of it was escaped and was uh, into the atmosphere, was emitted into the atmosphere, and transported around the earth. Another nice thing about lead is it has very low background levels in the natural environment. Uh, the, other sort, the other primary sources would be dust, continental dust, so just the lead occurring in dust or rock. And then also um, vulcan some volcanic eruptions have a significant amount of lead in them. Uh, the other thing, as I mentioned, we have uh, a little bit is we have very low detection limits. So when we were doing this experiment, you know, we can redesign, we can reconfigure this uh, depending on our, what our scientific objectives are on a particular project. In this case, we took this low-resolution ICPMS, and we only used it for lead measurements, actually thallium, lead, and bismuth was the suite. Uh, and by doing that, we were able to, to get lots and lots of measurements and end up with a, an, a detection limit on the order of, of about 0.01 picograms per gram. So that's 10 to the minus 12 grams per gram. So very, very low levels and very important for this kind of work. Uh, as I mentioned, I think uh, we analyzed a total of 423 meters of archived uh, North Grip 2 ice for this project. All right, Joe Morgan cannot answer this question, although it'd be a good test to see if he was paying attention last fall. Uh, so, so anybody want to hazard a guess of what the three most important words in paleo environmental work is? Anybody? All right, I won't make you do it. Um, dating, dating, and dating. <laughs> and this is a quote from Jeff Serringhouse. I don't know whether he lifted it from someone else. And, and this is important, especially if you're going to try to do accurate, you need accurate independent dating, especially if you're going to try to infer causality. So you see a change in the, in the ice core record or some other archive, you see a change in history. If you're going to say one is somehow linked to the other, implying causality, boy, you better make sure your dating is completely independent. Because if it's not, you're just tuning to get the correlation, right? So really, really important uh, dating is uh, absolutely critical. So I'm going to say a little bit about that. So this is a one meter section from 380 to 381 meters depth in the ice core, in the North Group 2 ice core. 
And I've plotted a bunch of different parameters, so uh, ammonium and sea salt, sodium in green, uh, non-sea salt calcium in purplish, I guess, magenta something, and then the two lead measurements uh, from the two ICPMSs in, in the blues. And then I've plotted, just to emphasize it, I've plotted the non-sea salt uh, sulfur to sea salt sodium ratio, and that's the one we could use for dating. So would anybody like to hazard a guess as to how many years you see across this? Remember, there's an annual cycle in all those chemi chemicals. So, right? So one meter, and, and we've got clearly one annual cycle, two annual cycle, three, four, five, right? So if we date this, again, we're just going to start at the top, and we're just going to count backwards these annual cycles. We're going to count them backwards. So here's AD 19, AD 18, AD 17, and so forth. And you can see it's very clear. The annual cycles in this section are very clear. I mean, there's not, not really a lot of debate. So we dated this ice core completely, not completely, uh, independently from 1259, the eruption of Somalis in Indonesia, a very distinctive marker in ice cores. We measured, we started there, and we just counted backwards one year at a time for the whole record, all the way back to about 1200 BC. So 20, what, whatever that is, 3,300 years, something like that. Um, I mean, 35. Anyway, so that's, that's how we date it. And we're going to, in this case, we use the midwinter non sea salt sulfur to uh, sea salt sodium minimum that we can see in the ice, right? So we just arbitrarily assign this date of January 1st every year, and that's how we date the core. We'd also like to be able to evaluate those chronologies in some way. So the dating of the ice core referred to as a chronology. We'd like to be able to date it in some independent way. And the way we do that is. We compare it to beryllium-10, and we can do it, it turns out, with uh, link to the tree ring records, the ice core records, through cosmogenic nuclides. And that would be 10 beryllium in ice and C14 in wood. We can do this at annual scales uh, using these uh, very high-frequency one- to two-year events that were reported by Miyake originally in Nature. And Michael Siegel, that, that uh, Joe mentioned, that Michael Siegel was, uh, really took this and ran with it. Uh, or we can do it at decadal time scales, uh, published by Adolfi and Muschler, their techniques. And the advantage is that we can then look at the ice core chronology that we developed, and we can try to do something. We can evaluate it and try it independently and try to assess the uncertainties in the ice core dating. And I'm not going to go into too much detail, but we did this. Uh, so this is our, our age scale minus the NCAL tree ring age scale. Uh, and, the, and what you see, the gray is their, their one sigma uncertainty in their dating. And you can see that our, our, our dating fits within their one, their, uh, their one sigma. So from that, we infer that we've got about a plus or minus two-year maximum dating uncertainty in our record. So to say to a historian, I think it's safe to say, to say to a historian or certainly to an archaeologist that you have one to two-year uncertainty in your dating 2,000 years ago is a pretty nice thing. <laughs> um, we also did that with the uh, Rossman et al. or the Hong et al. dating those 18 points. We evaluated their age scale. And age scales have evolved a lot in the last 30 years, as you can imagine. And it turned out that they were about 31 years off. So historians were using that information to infer things. And not only were there hardly any samples, but they were also misdated by about 30 years in antiquity. So things have been proved. Another question is lead provenance. So archaeological evidence suggests that Western Europe and China were the sort of the two possibilities for where these emissions could be coming from. So the question is, how do we know this is European lead and not, Egypt, or not Chinese lead? Right? And the way we know that, well, first of all, we built on Rossman's, da Rossman's results. So Rossman, uh, Kevin Rossman had measured the isotopes in those 13 samples, as I showed you at the beginning. And then if you plot it on 208 over 207 and 206 over 207, and you plot it in this space, you can see that they kind of fall along this line right here. And these circles represent different sources, different ore bodies uh, in Europe. And it looks like you know, all these measurements are consistent with a mixing model of European lead. So there's we can't say it is lead. It is from Europe. What we can say is it's consistent with Europe. Right? So it could be coming from China still, based on just the isotopic evidence alone. So we took that idea and we kind of, well, first of all, let me, let me say. So possible emission sites are in Western Europe and China during antiquity. Central Greenland up here is a long way from those lead silver mines in, in antiquity down in Europe. Uh, so we're, we're looking at basically transport from down here all the way up to Greenland. So long-range transport is implicit. Of course, it's even longer from China, right? So we can use a very much a state-of-the-art atmospheric model to, to investigate this. This is this FlexPart model that Andreas Stoll uh, and Sabina Eckhart contributed. Uh, 
which to do this kind of modeling, basically you have a, a source receptor. So if you're doing it in the forward direction, you start with the source, say the lead emissions, and you have the receptors out there and you transport the lead from the source to the receptors. You can run it in backward mode as well and look at the so receptor to source relationship. Uh, we need to have very, very detailed atmospheric fields to do this kind of work. And uh, of course, they don't exist for antiquity. So we used the 20th century reanalysis fields and assumed that the meteorology was basically the same, at least at the, at the large scale. So this is the result. Uh, this is the ice core sitting right here in the circle. And this is where uh, we, we model the emissions coming from down in here. And this is using this in backward mode. So this is this receptor to source. And what we found was that NGRIP2, the ice core site, was about 10 times more sensitive to European emissions than it is to Chinese emissions. So it is possible that you're getting Chinese emissions, but they would have to be extremely large uh, to overwhelm the Greenland signal. Right? So you can see China over here, they're very small numbers, and we're bigger numbers in here. So, so from that, we think that uh, we think between the isotopes, oh, there's one more, one more slide on that. We also looked at the fallout pattern as you moved away from the emissions areas, the, 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 the hypothesized emissions down here. And we looked at uh, peat bog records, published peat bog records as you moved away from this. And we would expect that to drop off more or less exponentially as you move away from the source. And that is indeed what we found. Um, you, know, you can see the black are the different, uh, 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 sorry, peat bog records and the red is our record. So it looks like there's, it, it behaves as though the source is in southern um, Europe. We also wanted to do, for the first time in an ice core study, I think, uh, we wanted to use the atmospheric modeling to assess how much, inter how much variability we would see in deposition just from the atmospheric transport alone. So we used the same FlexBart modeling, and what you come up with is a year-to-year -year difference in atmospheric transport results in about a 60% coefficient of variation uh, in the amount of lead that's deposited. So even if you had a constant source in southern Europe, by the time you transport and deposit in Greenland, it's going to have uh, about a 60% year-to-year variability uh, in the deposition. If you apply a 11-year median filter to it, uh, you preserve the median filter will preserve step functions, but you'll knock down a lot of that variability, and we get up with about a 22% coefficient of variation. So in the paper, we always used an error bar of plus or minus 22% when we talk about the lead record. Um, why Greenland? Why go to Greenland to do this? Uh, you might think going to the, to the Alps would make more sense. Alps are much closer and so forth. But unlike Greenland, alpine glaciers, unlike Greenland ice sheet, alpine glaciers are very thin and they have complex flow <coughs> histories. So if you get down to uh, ancient history, if you get down 1,000 or 2,000 years ago, the layers are extremely thin. I mean, millimeters or submillimeter thick layers, uh, making dating di difficult, independent dating difficult, and I would argue impossible. Uh, it also makes it, because there's so little material, you can't do that 10 beryllium sort of cosmogenic nucleide sort of comparison. There's just not enough material, and so it makes it very difficult to quantitatively assess how good those chronologies are. And then finally, sites can be very heavily influenced by, in Europe, can be he very uh, heavily influenced by small nearby emissions. And this is just ex an example of that. So this is that same flex part modeling, but this time for a, an ice core, a theoretical ice core from Col de Dome on Mont Blanc uh, in the French Alps. And you can see on the scale here, we're uh, 50 to 100 times more sensitive to emissions right around the Alps than we would be to emissions from Spain. So you can get a record, but there's a pretty good chance that record is going to be a local record of, of emissions from a nearby mine or a mine down the bottom of the valley below the ice core site. So there are some advantages in going far away, whereas when we're in Greenland up here, we're seeing sort of continental-wide emissions uh, because there, of course, are no emission sources anywhere near Greenland particularly at this time. So. OK, so let me just walk you through um, the interpretation of the record. So two things. Well, first of all, we've, we've switched from total lead to lead pollution. And we did that on the vertical axis. And we did that by subtracting the component of dust. So we measure a dust tracer, and we use the crustal abundance to subtract the, dust potential, the potential dust component. And then we, used, uh, and we, then we also estimated a volcanic uh, component. Not a big deal, it's about 13% of the total measured lead is what we subtracted, so it's not a, a big part of the signal. Uh, we are also gonna uh, convert, we also converted from concentration to flux, so we're looking at depositional flux onto the ice by multiplying by the water accumulation. 
uh, the concentration times the water accumulation. And then we're also going to use the FlexBart modeling to convert, we could convert it, and we did in the paper, from lead pollution in Greenland to estimated lead emissions in Europe. And we can do that with the sensitivity modeling for one kilogram per second of lead emission in southern Spain. The model would suggest you'd get 12.9, on average, 12.9 micrograms per meter squared of lead deposited in central Greenland. So we can use the lead pollution record to reconstruct European-wide emissions, granted with some, estimate, with some assumptions. But uh, so anyway, yeah, so at 0.75 micrograms per meter squared per year of pollution in Greenland would equate to 1.8 kilotons per year of emissions. And it turns out the archaeological estimates were pretty darn close to this. I think they were maybe within 50% of that number. So gives you a nice warm and fuzzy, right? Our record goes from, uh, in this case, we're going from uh, 1100 BC to 800 AD. So for those non-historians in the audience, that's the Iron Age through classical and late antiquity into the early Middle Ages. That includes the rise and fall of the Greek and Roman empires, right? As well as the migration, what we used to call the Dark Ages, and I think now is called the Migration Period. So let's just walk through it a little bit. So you can see this first rise back here. Well, what was that? And we can't say this is what it was, but it is at least coeval with the Phoenician expansion of trading from the Eastern Mediterranean towards the Western Mediterranean, All right? And you can see that the concentration goes up here initially here, it bounces up and down. Excuse me, by, um, by coincidence, this big jump happens at around the time that uh, Alexander the Great consolidated power. Uh, we didn't talk about that in the paper because we really didn't have a, a very good explanation for why that would have changed lead emissions, but anyway. It rises up, you can see some big drops, and then right here, that you can see this big bite out of the record in here. It rises, it drops rapidly, stays down for about 80 or 100 years, and then it jumps back up here, stays high, and then it falls dramatically right here, and eventually reaches a nadir right here. So what are those, what do they correspond to in history? And if we uh, compare them, it turns out that this uh, corresponds to the crisis of the Roman Republic. So this is the end of the Roman Republic when everybody's fighting each other and there are civil wars. Mark Antony and Cleopatra here at the end and so forth. Um, and that, that represent a very big dip in the lead pollution record, suggesting a much lower production of silver, at least in, Hispan in, in the Iberian Peninsula. So you had this big drop. And then uh, in the third century, this, this other dip corresponds to the third century crisis of Imperial Rome, uh, another, another period of political instability and military anarchy. Right? So very nicely, the, the two big bites out of the record fit very nicely with what we know about history during this period. Um, in between those two crises was uh, the Pax Romana, and I'm not sure if that's an accepted phrase in the, in the history world, but for us deophytes it is. Uh, anyway, so this is the period, the Pax Romana is a period of the good emperors from Caesar Augustus through Marcus Aurelius, approximately 27 BC to AD 180. And you can see that during that period, emissions were quite high and fairly stable, indicating substantial growth in the Roman economy during the imperial period. Um, you can also notice, if you uh, look carefully at it, you can see that lead pollution rose about 10 years after the beginning of the Pax Romana, after imperial rule and, and uh, Octavian becoming Caesar Augustus and taking over. Uh, it took about 10, 15 years for that to rise, maybe closer to 10, I guess. And then it also drops, the lead pollution dropped quite dramatically what, about 15 years before the death of Marcus Aurelius and the end of the Pax Romana. So the question is, why? Uh, when Andrew and I first saw this, we were a little bit puzzled by it. Well, it turns out that it, when, when Octavian took over as Caesar Augustus, he didn't immediately seize control. It took him about nine or 10 years to establish control over the provinces in, Sp in Spain and, and Gaul. And exactly, pretty much exactly when it should, the lead goes shooting up. And, and the reason that is, we think, is because of large-scale administrative changes that followed this pacification. So it was all about organization, all about getting those slaves into those mines and having them mine like crazy and smelt like crazy, right? Um, and it does coincide with this very immediate and persistent increase in lead. And then on the other side, on the other side, this drop on this side uh, corresponds exactly, I mean, to the year always keeping in the back of your head plus or minus one to two years uncertainty of the age scale. Uh, the advent of the Antonine Plague, one of the two, the, there were two great plagues in Roman antiquity. One was the Antonine Plague, the other was the Plague of Cyprian. And you can see we get this big drop in 165, and, and it, the drop continues to 193, more or less. Uh, and that's thought to be the smallpox, killing off roughly a third of the population of the Roman Empire. 
Uh, and then the, very, the nadir of our record uh, occurs here, and that exactly corresponds to the plague of Cyprian, uh, which I think historians aren't quite sure exactly what caused that. Uh, but again, a big die off the other great plague of Roman antiquity. Right, so very nice agreement with the historical record there. And then finally, linking back to the economy, uh, we've plotted silver and Roman coinage. So this is the amount of silver per Roman denarii coin, denarius coin. Uh, and you can see that the red, so this is based on hordes, measurements in hordes, and you can see that the, the coins, the fineness in the coins, the silver content in the coins drops off really pretty much in parallel with our drop off in lead pollution and what we would or postulate is effectively a, a tracer or an indicator of silver production in, in the Roman Empire, at least from Spain especially. And then it got so bad that in the, in the, after, the, after the plague of Cyprian, the Romans abandoned silver coinage at this point because, and went to a, a bronze and gold coin setup. Again, you can see the agreement is very nice uh, with our record. So let me conclude by saying, I hope I've convinced you that ice cores collected from uh, glaciers and ice sheets can contribute to historical studies. Uh, glaciers, one of the big advantages of glaciers is they sort of consistently and, and objectively record pollution and history, environmental history. Uh, you know, there's nobody making a decision about, well, you know, we wrote this or we found the papyrus in the, in the mask of an animal or whatever. There's nothing like that. It's a, it's a pretty objective recorder just sitting out there recording uh, information year after year, century after century. It does have its variability, as I mentioned, that 66%, 60, 60% coefficient of variation, but at least it's something we can quantify and work with and, and evaluate. Uh, continuous measurements, I, I think I've sh I hope I showed you, that are much more efficient and especially much more cost effective than discrete measurements. Uh, distal records do have some advantages over proximal, uh, particularly if proximal to the sources, potential sources. Uh, atmospheric underst understanding the atmospheric transport and deposition is really, really important, we feel, and I think is the future. And then dating, dating, and dating, of course, as usual. And then replication between sites. And we haven't replicated the Roman period yet, but we have replicated a lot of other periods in the Ligard records, and we get very nice replication. For the lead record, I've hope, I hope I've convinced you that uh, lead closely tracked historical events during antiquity that periods of social unrest coincided mostly with downturns in pollution. Unrest definitely, but wars sometimes increased, sometimes decreased. Plagues were especially, especially had a major impact. Uh, the Pax Romana, contrary to the previous interpretations on those 18 points, the Pax Romana is seen now as a period of strong economic growth. Uh, and then finally, the silver uh, in, the, in the denarii declined in parallel. In terms of future plans, uh, obviously we would like to extend this this, these records and this analysis in either direction. Uh, we'd like to go back from uh, the beginning of the Iron, uh, the, uh, the Iron Age back into the Bronze Age and the collapse of the Bronze Age and all that sort of thing. And we'd, of course, like to go this way. We're working on this because we have these records, but as I'll say, tell you in a minute, we don't have these records, although we're working on getting them. We'd also like to take the work that Joe Manning has done, and this is what we were talking about yesterday and uh, while we were eating <laughs> many times. Uh, we were talking about extending this, this linkage between explosive volcanism, climate, and ancient history or historical events. Uh, back in Joe, and, uh, in this paper, he worked on Ptolemaic Egypt. We'd like to, of course, go back in time to the Bronze Age collapse and, and uh, the New Kingdom and so forth. Uh, well, you might say, um, you might say, well, Joe, just go do it. Joe's, Joe's, just go do it. <laughs> but. Uh, Fundamental to both of these objectives is collection of a, of a, uh, and development of much longer accurately dated records uh, of these store, of ice core records, right? The problem in Greenland ice cores is that uh, you, en you end up hitting the, the brittle ice, the overpressured brittle ice at about 600 meters, which corresponds to about 1,000 BC roughly, depending on the site. And when you hit that brittle ice, when, as soon as you, it's overpressured, you bring it up to the surface, you drill it, you bring it up to the surface, and if you're not extremely careful, and sometimes even if you are extremely careful, it explodes. Uh, and that's because it's, it's, you know, it's overpressured, so poof, it explodes. But you can imagine for our continuous analysis, that makes it very difficult to measure, uh, or impossible to measure it. So then you say, well, what about all those coastal domes or small Arctic islands in, in, in the Arctic uh, Ocean? Well, the problem there is they, those are like, like the alpine cores. They tend to be relatively thin, and they thin too rapidly to get any kind of independent dating. Uh, so we analyzed one from Noose Peninsula last year or two years ago, and uh, the annual layer thickness at, zero, at 1 AD, let's say, 
is, uh, is on the order of a millimeter thick. So very difficult to, to date independently. We can get a record, but we can't date it independently. And if you're going to do this historical work, that's what you need. So, anyway, thanks, and happy to take any questions. And just for you historians, there's the famous Andrew Wilson from Oxford helping us. He came out to the lab and helped us analyze the core. So, anyway, thank you. Questions, comments. Come on, you historian. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. That was um, much above my pay grade. But uh, I, I had a question about uh, what what can and can't be measured. Would it be possible to measure tin, um, given that? Uh, given its significance in the creation of bronze, uh, and it's perhaps being able to help with problems of identifying where the tin was coming from uh, during the Bronze Age. Yeah, it's a good question. So um, when, the, when the Oxford people first came to me, they were really hoping we could get copper uh, because of the bronze connection. And um, it's a signal to noise ratio issue. So there's a, quite a bit of copper out there in dust and seawater and so forth. And so the background variability is reasonably high. And the pollution signal is relatively low. Unlike lead, you know, they're not producing, they're not losing that much copper. Uh, we'd like to measure sil silver as well, but again, silver has the same problem. The signal to noise ratio just isn't there. Now that said, Hong, Hong reported measurements of copper from those 18 samples. He reported measurements of copper, but we measure copper, but we just don't see any any signal yet. Uh, now we could put more effort into that. Maybe that's what we'll do uh, if we're successful in getting funded to collect more more cores. And, and tin, by the way, sorry, tin is in the same boat. Uh, tin, zinc, things like that have quite a high background variability, so detecting the pollution signal is hard. So, thank you. Okay. So arsenic, uh, again, is a difficult one. We would have to, it turns out that arsenic has inter isobaric interferences in the ICPMS. So we would have to dedicate uh, one instrument just to arsenic if we were going to measure arsenic. Uh, we have measured antimony as a as kind of an indicator, you know, a, a proxy, if you will, of arsenic. Uh, and we don't see, we see a lot of, of recent uh, antimony pollution. Very clearly with the coal burning era, you can see big increases in antimony. Uh, but we don't see it in the, in this period. So. Again, I think it's a signal noise issue, and yeah, uh, maybe we'll redouble our efforts to try to get it. Can you simultaneously look for some climate signals? I mean, there are some fairly rapidly changing climate signals through this thousand-year period that you described here. Can you look at that as well somehow? Sure, and, and I guess one of the questions is, um, so the focus of this study was specifically on the lead pollution as an indicator of the economy. Uh, you could imagine linking volcanoes or linking looking at water isotopes and things like that to see if there were as any evidence of climate drivers of some of that instability. So you have you know, the crisis of the Roman Republic. Was it just societal or was there a climate driver behind it? Uh, certainly with all the things we measure with you know, dust for aridity, black carbon for, for biomass burning, uh, water isotopes and so forth. We measure a lot of things that you could use we, and do use as climate proxies. But we haven't done that yet. So actually, it's one of the things we were kind of talking about. <laughs> Everyone's being very shy. Uh, thank you. That was really uh, fascinating. Um, and I'll confess up front, I haven't done science in a very long time, so please forgive me if this is a silly question. Um, but I'm really interested in um, the, the, the comments you made about the, the distant sources of ice and the more localized sources of ice. And I'm wondering if there's any way that the more localized sources could perhaps refine the picture or contribute to the picture that you've given us here in any meaningful way. Yeah, no, it, 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 the question all basically revolves around, are you interested in those local sources or not? 
uh, because um, the peat bog people, for instance, have been looking and using peat bogs to study local sources of pollution for decades. Uh, and so that's the question is, are, if, you, if you can see through those local sources or if you're interested in those local sources, great. But if you're not, uh, there's always this danger you're gonna be swamped by those local sources. And then there's the dating, the dating question is huge, right? Uh, I think uh, a lot of the alpine cores are basically thin, many of them are thin to the point where you can't see, or you can't even guess what the age is prior to about 300, 400 years ago. And others uh, do have a more, more uniform uh, layering, but again, you have no way. There's, the other thing I didn't mention is they tend to be dirty. You know, an alpine core, you can throw a rock and hit a rock and hit something at the surface. Whereas in Greenland, you know, we're 500 kilometers from the nearest rock at the surface. Uh, and so um, consequently, they're much dirtier. So seeing volcanoes, seeing, uh, detecting volcanoes for validation of your age scale and things like that, much more difficult than in the alpine, and then in the, uh, the polar ice cores. So. Before the Vikings got to Greenland, which is what that might be a local source. Is that right, or, or did I read your diagram? Your time You're talking about that increase in uh, eight, about 800. Yeah, you're talking about this increase here. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, the historians, we we were <coughs> milking the publications, so we stopped at 800 because this is really about classical antiquity. We do have records that go, in fact, a number of records that go up to the present. And that's the thing we're working on now is trying to interpret the, the Middle Ages, the lead records of the Middle Ages. Uh, I think most of my uh, historian colleagues think this is uh, Charlemagne and the Merovingian, something like that, <laughs> kings. <laughs> so this is just to show you, you say you hadn't done science in a while. Uh, for me, I hadn't done history in a long time. So when I first met these guys from Oxford and they shook my hand and said they were classicists and I tried to act like I knew what they were talking about. And as soon as I got on some time myself, I looked up on the internet, what the heck is a classicist? So, <laughs> now I know, now I know. So, uh, but anyway, that, that, so yeah, Charlemagne. And, and then the other thing is, so there I think we're gonna have to look at patterns. Of course, we wanna get isotopes to, to try to, to pin it down. Uh, but we're gonna have to look at patterns, including the, the uh, peat bogs. And I don't know if you noticed earlier, but that, that event was in some peat bogs and not in others. And I think what that's telling us is that I don't think that's Charlemagne after all. I think that's Mendips in, uh, in Britain. I think that's lead mining in, in Britain. But we shall see, so stay tuned. How useful are, are these measurements for understanding things in the Southern Hemisphere? Yes, that's a great question. So, uh, of course, transporting aerosol in the troposphere across the equator is virtually impossible because uh, it either gets rained out or it doesn't circulate in the right way. Uh, you can get some stratospheric transport, but probably not of these things. Um, we, did, we do do work in the southern hemisphere. We published a paper three or four years ago looking at lead pollution over the last 400 years based on an array of ice cores. And, uh, you know, Brian Skinner's colleagues are responsible for this. Uh, in 1888, uh, pollution in Antarctica turned on, almost like a light switch. It went from low levels to all of a sudden high. And that was, it, it correlates and the isotopes correlate exactly to the beginning of mining and smelting in Port Pirie in South Australia. And in literally in one year, you can see it all over Antarctica in one year. And it's amazing. So the other thing that's amazing is that um, pollution, lead pollution arrived at South Pole 22 years before Amundsen and Scott. So it's hard to imagine they were skiing over, you know, uh, clearly polluted snow uh, on their way there. So I guess, I guess uh, Scott was trudging and Amundsen was gliding along on his skis. But. Anybody else? So uh, throughout the period, do you see a change in the potential locations for where the lead's coming from, that certain areas seem to shut down or uh, So we need to rely, uh, this record being so distal, uh, again, we're focused on the big picture, uh, almost not continental, continental scale, but certainly largely regional emissions. Uh, one of the reasons for that whole coefficient of variation analysis with the modeling, the atmospheric modeling, was because I had to stop Andrew from seeing a bump and saying, oh, that's the that's the destruction of the Roman two legions in the Teutonic forest or something. <laughs> and I was trying to pull him back from too, over-interpreting the record. 
Uh, so we certainly see spikes, they, whether they're just transport spikes or maybe volcanic spikes. Uh, we don't know, but the, the overall pattern is consistent with the, with the pollution source. Yeah, so for instance, this peak right here, everybody wants to know what that is. And my guess is it's a volcano. Uh, and my guess, is, my guess is it's volcanic tephra. So. I'm just curious, are there any like, anthropologists who are also interested in geochemistry? I mean, I mean, it's not like lead poisoning. Are there remains in any of these mine sites that are looking at like the, the bone composition? Yeah, great question. The, the tissues? Yeah, so certainly people are looking at, at teeth and uh, at bones uh, for lead and lead in those two um, archives, let's call them. Um, and in fact, we're working on that. I was telling Joe and others at lunch that we're working on that. Um, no, it was earlier than that. Um, we're working on, on using our lead record to try to assess background pollution exposure. Uh, so up until this time, if you read books about, you know, some people, there was actually speculation that the fall of the Roman Empire was because of the uh, health impacts, especially on IQ and things like that, of the elite. I don't think that's, would you say that's, I, I think that's, most people wouldn't believe that was significant in the cause, uh, fall of Rome, but, but I don't know. I'm not a historian. Um, but the, uh, anyway, we're interested in, in the atmospheric background level. So we can now, with this modeling and these emissions, we can assess uh, with modeling what, what the concentrations were likely to be and assess sort of what the background uh, exposure to lead was, was in the general populace. So, so epidemiological study of it. So. But, but there are measurements of, of people of bones that, of, of lead that are published in the literature. Our challenge, I think, is going to be finding people who are separate from, say, leaded pipes or drinking lead-sweetened wine and things like that. It's going to be finding that background so this is the, you know, the, the, the background concentration, not in addition to any exposure you'd get through food or, or water or whatever. So, yeah, it's, it's really sad that the mines, I don't know if those of you who know, um, the, the things I've read suggest that the life, the life expectancy of a slave once he entered the mines, in the lead mines, was six years. Uh, it would have been a grisly job and a grisly death, I think. So. And you mentioned that uh, isotopic analysis is helping for coroners. Does there a way to improve it? Like, we make it more sensitive? You know, like, not just comparison of China and Europe, but even within Europe or in different regions. Is there room for improvement in that? Well, so, so the question is about lead, lead, using uh, more detailed measurements of lead isotopes to uh, make a more detailed study of lead provenance. Uh, both during this time period and during, well, both directions, right? We certainly do like to do it that way and that way. And one of the reasons uh, that, we, that we stopped the analysis here in antiquity is because once you get over here, now there are lots and lots of sources. And so we really do need to have isotopes to help us tease that apart. Uh, the problem, uh, so I've contacted the manufacturers of our ICPMSs and the people who have, maybe you have a multi-collector ICPMS in this building, I don't know, so maybe I should talk to somebody. But anyway, the, uh, I've contacted their research groups in hopes of getting them to try to make measurements uh, at these levels, very, very difficult measurements to make. And basically all the manufacturers I've talked to have said, we can't do it. So we have to go someplace else. Anyway. Yeah, we'd, like, we'd very much like to. We'd like, we'd like, we have samples through this whole period. You remember those fraction collectors that were built into the analytical system? So we have samples going all the way through there that it's the same water that gets injected to the ICPMS. So we know we can, we can uh, monitor all the cal uh, qu uh, contamination uh, thing, uh, issues. So we have samples going all the way through this, and we'd like to run those samples uh, for lead isotopes. Uh, but as I said, they, they say they can't measure it. So even the latest and greatest can't measure it. So I guess the only option is going to be uh, we're going to have to evaporate, evaporate them to concentrate the, the lead. And so we, and that's the only way. But that's a lot more work than just handing somebody a bottle and running it through their multi-collector ICPMS. So that's a good question, though. Jen. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the transport models and what we know? I mean, obviously, we have really good data about the modern transport. Um, Issues, but I'm thinking back in time and bigger changes in the climate system. Are there are there simulations to try to perturb those or imagine how it would affect? Or we sort of just 
assume that it was relatively stable? In our case, we just assumed it was stable. And it's because you need such sophisticated fields. And so when we talked to, uh, what's her name, Betty Otto Bleisner, I think it is, at, at, C at NCAR, um, you know, the uncertainties that would be associated with trying to have atmospheric fields for this time period are much greater than, <laughs> it just wouldn't work. Uh, so we're really kind of stuck. I mean, the issue for this situation was, is there, I mean, another, an alternative explanation to this would be, is, was there a major circulation change, like a change in AMOC or something like that, right here, right here, right here. And uh, nothing else that we measure in the ice cores, those 35 different things we measure, none of them show anything that suggests a climate change at that point. Uh, and to my knowledge, there's no other evidence from trees or anything else of any significant change in circulation. But it is always an issue, of course. It's, it's always out there that maybe long-range transport shifted enough to actually create an anomaly. But, yeah. Uh, you talk about uh, volcanoes eruption as a source of dust and anything. Do you have correlated plot with the historical eruption in Rico? Definitely. Yeah, so it, it, you'd be amazed, though, at how few eruptions actually have an independent historical date on them. Uh, what's the oldest? Do you know what the oldest? Well, Santorini, I guess. 44, for sure. But we don't know which eruption it was. We don't know what erupted, right, in 44, uh, 44 BC. Yeah. Um, we know there was a major eruption. There were two in 40, we think maybe 44, 46 BC, but we don't know what their source was. Uh, so, but yeah, definitely whenever there are, is a date that we can compare to a, a radiocarbon date or a historical date, we tie that to the volcanic record. And of course, we look for tephra and geof... Uh, tephra is a little like the... is a little bit like the uh, provenance question. You can only say that it's consistent with this source, but you can't really say it is that source because you could have multiple volcanoes with reasonably close to the same source. So. Last minute. If not, please join me in thanking Jim. Thanks for coming. Thanks. <laughs>